so you both got the paper, the paper one assignment sheet last time, right? I think I already passed that out when we talked about it. Okay. Okay. Okay, great. So here is the handout I said I was going to give you on introductions and conclusions. So what we've got here, right, was we've got, um, you know, a couple of steps or a couple of requirements for writing a decent introduction and a good conclusion, right? And then I've got examples here for you um, <clears throat> to use as models when you are trying to write an introduction or conclusion. Um, and one thing that I do want to say about these parts of the paper, right, they're often the hardest parts of the paper to write. and it's probably a good idea if you actually write them last, right? You don't have to write the introduction first, right? Write a few body paragraphs, see what it is you're actually trying to say, what it is you're actually trying to argue, right? And then go back and write the introduction. Right. The introduction does not, in fact, probably shouldn't be the first thing you try to write because then you're kind of straight jacketing yourself in a particular path too quickly. All right, so for next time, you're gonna be reading the next 30 pages or so of Candide. And again, I want you to select a quote on which you think you can do a free write, right? So it's probably a good idea if you pick something that you think goes with the quote you picked for today, right? that you know, adds up to a kind of pattern. What we're gonna do with these free rights, right? They're, I'm gonna collect them, but I'm not going to grade them. I am gonna give you feedback on them, though. And um, my hope is that by the time we're done looking at Voltaire and Rousseau, you will have um, kind of built up um, something that you can use the basis for paper one. That kind of, it's kind of like the beginnings of an argument. So for today's free writing, here's what I want you to do, right? So the first thing you're going to do is copy your chosen quote. top of the page, right? So you constantly have it there for reference, right? Then you are going to try to close read the language of that quote, right? things like multiple meanings, interesting metaphors, and strands and binaries. Finally, what I want you to try to do is place the quote, after you've done this kind of close analysis, try to place the quote back into the broader context, context of the novella. Right. What's it doing here? And I realize that this may be a lot to get done in 12 minutes, right? So if you don't get all the way there, it's okay. Especially since this is the first time we're doing it like this, right? But just, you know, take 12 minutes, do what you can, and then we'll, uh, <clears throat> then we'll talk about the book, okay? All right, so go ahead. Your 12 minutes starts now.
remember to just keep writing for the whole 12 minutes, even if you feel like you're stuck.
two more minutes. Okay, that's time. So just make sure that to turn that in at the end of class. Um, so <clears throat> before I get started with some of the background stuff here, do either of you have questions about the reading? Like, is there is there some, is there anything that particularly confused you or that you want to know about before we proceed here? Like, was it anything that got you particularly hung up? Let's start with that. Any questions about anything? No? Nothing confused you? <laughs> it's okay, like, you know, if you do have questions, there's nothing to be embarrassed about, right? I, I get also that this is difficult, but, okay. So, I guess uh, we'll just start by giving you some context. Um, <clears throat> so, I, are either of you familiar with the concept of the Enlightenment, either from high school classes or from history classes you're taking? Or okay, what's the Enlightenment? When I talk about the Enlightenment, what do I? Mean? Okay, um, so <clears throat> the Enlightenment is an intellectual and cultural movement of the 17th and 18th centuries. A lot of contemporary thinkers regard the Enlightenment as kind of like the intellectual basis for the modern world as it develops after the Industrial Revolution. So <clears throat> the basic principle that informs most Enlightenment era thinking is the idea of reason as the primary attribute of human beings. Right, the fact that we can reason for an Enlightenment philosopher um, is the most important thing about us, right? 
that reason is the most important thing we possess because it allows us to work our way through social problems, right? So if we just apply reason to every issue in our society, then <clears throat> there's got to be some way we can solve it, right? So there are a couple of things that are happening in prior centuries that lead up to this, right? One is the Protestant Reformation in the 15th and 16th centuries. So do either of you know what the Reformation was? Is this term familiar to either of you? No? Yeah, it, it's, it's about religion, right? So in Europe in the Middle Ages, what was the dominant religion? Do either of you know? Okay. Yes, the Catholic Church was dominant in particularly Western Europe for the Middle Ages and most of the Renaissance, right? So the Protestant Reformation is at the end of the 15th century is important because it represents certain groups breaking away from the authority of the church, right? So it involves a kind of questioning of um, the church's power to dictate uh, matters of belief, right? So we have a kind of an erosion of traditional religious authority. And all of this is kind of pushed further along by a specific invention, right? A specific piece of technology that we have come to take so for granted that we tend not to think of it as revolutionary. The printing press. Now why might something as simple as a printing press um, be a revolutionary invention? What does it allow? Yeah, people can print stuff, right? And if it's easier for people to print material, right, and then to circulate material, right, what does that do with ideas? Yeah, you can get more ideas out to more people, right? In a, in, you know, much faster than you could um, simply by walking around talking to people, um, you know, giving speeches, giving lectures, or whatever, right? Or you know even um, you know you're writing you know writing out you know manuscripts by hand in a book, which is what people had to do prior, right? So the printing press allows for particularly for for radical ideas to start to spread um, a lot faster than they had at any point in the past. So. <clears throat> Out of the Enlightenment, right, come, there, there are a couple of kind of basic principles that most Enlightenment philosophers tend to follow, right? One is that they are anti superstition. What's a superstition? I don't, I don't know what it is because I believe it. Okay. Uh, like when I see a black cat, uh -huh. put, well, we don't drive it, so I put it in the Okay. It's something like that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, is there any good reason for believing that black cats are bad luck? Honestly, I don't know. But... <laughs> yeah, there, there is no valid scientific reason, right, that says that a black cat is any more unlucky than any other animal, right? We have tended traditionally to associate black cats with things like witchcraft, right? Which, yeah which, you know, is frankly, you know, 
some of the sweetest animals I've ever known have been black cats, right? My aunt had a black cat that was that was awesome. She had a she had a black Labrador as well. She got them together when they were a puppy and a kitten, and the cat the cat used to sleep on the dog, and you often wouldn't know where one um, began and the other ended until the cat opened its eyes. So yeah, black cats are good. <laughs> Don't be afraid of black cats. But yeah, the the, ba the basic idea is that superstitions are these kind of traditional beliefs that are handed down that we, there, there's no rational basis for believing them, right? There's no rational basis, for example, for believing that nailing a horseshoe over your door is good luck, right? Or that walking under a ladder is bad. There actually is a rational... Um, like, a, there, there is a reasonable explanation as to why walking under a ladder is bad luck, right? Shit is likely to fall on you if you do that. But, you know, like breaking a mirror, seven years bad luck, right? Things like that. Yeah. Yeah, so su yeah, superstitions, yeah, or all these kind of like beliefs in, beliefs in supernatural events and supernatural happenings, right? That um, we have no reasonable, rational basis for holding. So, Enlightenment philosophers tend to be anti-superstition and anti-the supernatural, right? Even a lot of their ideas of religion are largely stripped of things like angels and devils. They are pro-free expression. In general, you should be allowed to say and think what you want according to an Enlightenment philosopher, even if other people think it's stupid, right? And of course, if you think what someone says is stupid, then you are free to call them out and say that you think it's stupid, right? In fact, you know, a lot of what Candide is, is Voltaire calling out another philosopher and calling his beliefs stupid, right? We'll get to that in a minute, right? But in general, right, the idea here is freedom of expression. You should be free to say and to print what you want. Now, this is largely because um, in countries that had powerful monarchies like France, the press was often restricted. And in particular, um, countries where the Catholic Church was still very powerful often restricted publications, right? To um, things that were considered religiously orthodox. Enlightenment thinkers also tend to prefer the universal over the specific. So they, they, they tend to, to like to think about ideas that they think cover all or most of humanity, right? That they generally think that people are more similar than different and that what applies to one group of people applies to another as well, right? That reason, for example, is universal among human beings. Um, it's also out of the Enlightenment that we get the scientific method and what was then the new model of Newtonian physics, right? So. Does anybody under, does that, do you both know how the scientific method works? Or if I'm proceeding with an experiment via the scientific method, what am I doing? What are the steps? What do I, actually, what comes before the hypothesis? There's a step before hypothesis. What's that? I said I can do it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the hypothesis has to come from somewhere, right? Let's start the experiment. The experiment comes after the hypothesis, right? So you start with observation. Right, you have to make an observation. Um, of, you observe some phenomenon in, nature, phenomenon in nature, right? You come up with a hypothesis as to why this is happening, right? Or 
what its significance is. Yes, and then you design an experiment to test it repeatedly, right? And then if your test works out, and most of the time it doesn't, you end up with a theory. People don't start doing science this way until about the end of the 17th century, right? So this is a product of Enlightenment thinking. The way people used to do science is closer to what Enlightenment thinkers would call superstition, right? So say I'm a doctor in Paris in the 14th century, and one of my patients comes to me with some with a blood disease, right? I prescribe for that patient a ruby ground up and mixed in red wine and then drunk to cure their blood. What's the logic that I'm using to make that prescription? Ruby in red wine to cure your blood. They are red. Yeah, I'm, yeah, exactly. I'm prescribing this to you because they're all red, right? The basic logic of science and medicine before the Enlightenment was based purely on association. Right? Things that are similar um, help each other, right? Things that are different, things that are dissimilar hinder each other, harm each other. So, like, I don't know um, if either of you read your horoscope. Um, okay, yeah, don't, because they're bullshit. <laughs> it's impossible, you know, to make predictions about what's going to happen. Um, to great big masses of people based purely on their being born within a 30-day period. Right? Um, but yeah, astrology works that way too. Right? So because my birthday is in late March, um, I am supposed to have some of the characteristics of the ram, right? Because the sun happened to be in that constellation at the time that I was born. Aries. Yeah. To the extent that it matters, <laughs> right? But yeah, so like, yeah, so you know, scientific logic was based on these kinds of symbolic associations, right? So the scientific method comes in and blows all of that away. Now there are still, you know, in our contemporary world, some kind of lingering echoes of that, like newspaper horoscopes and whatnot, right? But um, <clears throat> yeah, on the whole, what we're getting is a new way of looking at nature and a new model for understanding the cosmos as well, right? Um, what Newton and Galileo and Copernicus taught us is, well, what? Where did we used to believe the Earth was positioned in the solar system? Yeah, in fact, we wouldn't have even called it a solar system, right? Because we regarded the Earth as the center. And again, like if you're just looking up into the sky from the Earth, it looks like we are in the middle, right? It looks like everything revolves around us. Um, but <clears throat> what Galileo and, Co Galileo and Copernicus demonstrated is that in fact, the sun is at the center, and all of the other so-called fixed stars, right, what we call planets, revolve around it. Now what Newton did was demonstrate that the planets had fixed orbits as well, right, mathematically. So what Newton gives us is the idea of a rational orderly universe in which things happen in predicti predictable, observable patterns. Right, that if you're just paying attention, if you're just watching the right things, right, you will notice that <clears throat> Nature tends to behave, the universe tends to behave in 
predictable ways about which we can make observable laws, right? Okay. So, <clears throat> part of the upshot of this, combined particularly with these new technologies and um, cultural movements that undermine traditional religious authority, we end up with a belief system uh, that a number of Enlightenment thinkers subscribe to called deism. Have either of you heard of this before? Okay, so a deist believes. So, actually, kind of like what deism is, is religion kind of stripped of any, any kind of supernatural trappings, right? A deist believes that there is a god, but all that god did was create the universe and set it in motion, and then step back from it, right? That that god no longer takes any kind of active role in human affairs. Right. Basically just a kind of divine engineer who builds a machine that <laughs> keeps running on its own. Okay, so any questions about any of this so far? So this is the basic intellectual environment, right, in which Voltaire was writing. So let's look at some of the specific ideas that he was responding to. You don't have to give me written answers for those. I'm going to give you more at the end of this class. What those are intended to do is give you, help you by giving you things to focus on, right? If you try to answer those questions, you'll probably understand better what's going on in the, in the text. Um, but you don't have to give me a written answer to them. Does that answer your question? Okay. All right. So this gentleman here is Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, born 1646, died 1716. Now, apart from having what is probably history's most fabulous wig, right, that, is a, that is a hell of a wig, Leibniz was a mathematician and a philosopher. Right? In fact, Leibniz is largely responsible for a lot of the ideas that <clears throat> allow modern computers to work. Right? Um, you know, he had, of course, no concept of a computer. He died in 1716. But the mathematical principles on which computers work were developed by Leibniz at the beginning of the 18th century. So, <clears throat> very important dude, right? Now, he belonged to a school of philosophers called the rationalists. And rationalists believed that you could take the mathematical patterns of Newton's physics and basically apply them to human life, right? That everything in the universe
works according to observable, predictable patterns. Just like the gravitational orbits of planets. Which meant that if you understood these natural laws, if you understood how the universe operated, right, and even how human affairs operated, right, what the rational underpinnings of that were, then you could affect social change. Now Leibniz takes a slightly different tack and doesn't really seem to believe that social, social change is necessary or desirable. So in 1710, he wrote a book called Theodicy. I'm going to assume that none of you know what a theodicy is. Okay, so a theodicy is a concept in philosophy that is pretty much as old as religion itself, right? A theodicy is an attempt to explain why bad things happen if God is good and just and all-powerful, right? So if God is all good and all-powerful, right, why can't he simply make bad things not happen? So Leibniz's answer is that if it were possible to create a better world, than this one. God would have done so, being that he is all good and all powerful. Therefore, the world we live in is the best of all possible worlds. Right? <clears throat> that this is as good as it gets. Now, can we think of any possible consequences of that line of reasoning. If this world is already the best of all possible worlds, what then becomes impossible or undesirable? What's that? It's a word not like ours. Okay. Um, let me put it a different way. Um, if this is a good, if we live in the best of all possible worlds, what are the implications for human actions, right? What should we then not try to do? Change. Yeah. <laughs> right? Don't mess with it, right? Leave it as it is. Like, who are you to mess with the handiwork of God, puny mortal, right? And whether or not that's what Leibniz intended, that's the message that a lot of people take from his theodicy, right? So Voltaire writes Candide, or starts writing Candide, in, it's published in 1759. And it's pop written and published in part as a response to a terrible earthquake in the city of Lisbon in Portugal in 1755. And this earthquake um, destroys about a third of the city and kills um, I, um, I forget the exact figure, but something like a third of the city's population, right? So it's an enormous natural disaster. And at the same time, Voltaire is considering the ideas in Leibniz's Theodicy, and he's thinking, like, this is the biggest crock of horseshit I've ever read, right? If this is the best of all possible worlds, right, what kind of maniac god 
would design a world in which 30,000 people are just simply wiped out by an earthquake for no good reason, right? So Leibniz is often associated with philosophical optimism, right? The, you know, this, the, since everything's already great, right, why bother to try to improve anything? And what Voltaire is trying to do in this novella is call into question these principles, right? That, you know, we don't need to do anything to make society better or to fix society um, because everything's already so good, right? Now, if there's a character in the novel who seems to voice ideas similar to Leibniz's, who would it be? Yes, exactly. The philosopher Pendleton. And even his name suggests that we should be suspicious of him. Because if we translate this from Greek into English, it means something like all talk. So let's look at some examples of Pangloss's philosophizing and see what we can make of it. So, <clears throat> if we look on page one, right. Pangloss was a professor of metaphysico theologico cosmolunagology right. And that's meant to sound like nonsense, right? One of, one of Voltaire's favorite techniques is to use nonsense language to tend to belittle people that he thinks are talking shit, right? He proved admirably that there is no effect without a cause, and that in this best of all possible worlds, the Baron's castle was the most magnificent of castles, and his lady the best of all possible baronesses. It is demonstrable, said he, that things cannot be otherwise than as they are. For all being created for an end, all is necessarily for the best end. Observe that the nose has been formed to bear spectacles. Thus we have spectacles. Legs are visibly designed for stockings, and we have stockings. Stones were made to be hewn and to construct castles. Therefore my lord has a magnificent castle, for the greatest baron in the province ought to be the best lodge. Lodge, pigs were made to be eaten. Therefore, we eat pork all the year round. Consequently, they who assert that all is well have said a foolish thing. They should have said, all is for the best. So what do you make about, what do you make of Pangloss's reasoning here? How's this sound to you? Yeah, that everything has to happen for a reason, right? That everything has a cause. This is a direct reference to Leibniz's theory of sufficient reason. Right, and the principle of sufficient reason states that everything has a cause, right? That is a sufficient reason. is no effect observable in nature that does not have a cause. So Leibniz would reject the idea, you know, like, you know, eh, things just happen, what the hell, right? For Leibniz, everything happens for a reason. And every effect has a cause. Now, I think we see some of the upshot of this <clears throat> on page 10 when James the Anabaptist drowns, right? 
So if you look at that first paragraph there, right? Half dead of that inconceivable anguish which the rolling of a ship produces, one half of the passengers were not even sensible of the danger. The other half shrieked and prayed. The sheets were rent, the masts broken, the vessel gaped. Work who would, no one heard, no one commanded. The Anabaptist being upon deck bore a hand. When a brutish sailor struck him roughly and laid him sprawling, with the violence of the blow, he, he himself tumbled head foremost overboard and stuck upon a piece of the broken mast. Honest James ran to his assistance, hauled him up, and from the effort he, was, he made was precipitated into the sea in sight of the sailor, who left him to perish without deigning to look at him. Right? So what happens here to James the Anabaptist? Yeah, he dies. Like, well, what's the process here? Like, he helps someone, and then they don't even help them back. Yeah, he, yeah, the, this, the, right, this jerk hits him, and then falls into the sea. He fishes the guy out. The guy pushes him overboard, and doesn't do anything to help him. Right? Candide, Candide drew near and saw his benefactor who rose above the water one moment and was then swallowed up forever. He was just going to jump after him, but was then prevented by the philosopher Pangloss, who demonstrated him, to him that the Bay of Lisbon had been made on purpose for the Anabaptists to be drowned. While he was proving this a priori, the ship foundered. All perished except Pangloss, Candide, and that brutal sailor who had drowned the good Anabaptist. The villain swam safely to the shore, while well, Pangloss and Candide were born thither on plank. So let's just kind of take a minute here. And trace Candide's history with James the Anabaptist. Like for, for, first off, I'm assuming neither of you know what an Anabaptist is, right? Okay, so the Anabaptists were a religious sect, Protestant sect. that rejected infant baptism. Right, the idea was that the only people who should be baptized were adults who had made a free choice to be baptized, right? That if you're baptizing infants, then you're just kind of like, you know, <clears throat> you're bringing people into the church without them really fully understanding the implications or the the reasons for this. And Anabaptists actually do still exist. Uh, the Amish and the Mennonites are both Anabaptist groups. Um, but yeah, so in in the 18th century, Anabaptist would have had kind of like a uh, like connotations of radicalism. And what have Candide's interactions with James the Anabaptist been like up to this point? Yeah, James has been good to him, right? James is the only person who helps him, um, you know, when he is, you know, starving and wandering, you know, wandering the streets. He helps Pangloss when Pangloss is found dying of syphilis, right? He helps pay for his cure. And how does Pangloss repay the bastard? By letting him drown. Just letting him drown, right? And saying that, well, the Bay of Lisbon clearly exists for the purpose of drowning James the Anabaptist, right? So we have here our cause and effect. And why question it? Now, when it says that Pangloss is proving this a priori, it's important to pause on that for a second. I'm assuming you also probably don't understand that concept, right? Don't know what that means. Okay, so a priori is a term that is used in philosophy. And a priori means to try to demonstrate something using theoretical deduction
rather than observation or experience. So the fact that Pangloss is always trying to reason this way, right, trying to reason a priori, also tells us something about his knowledge, right? What are the sorts of things Pangloss knows? Where does his knowledge come from? If this is the way he reasons. Theoretical, yeah. So if everything he believes he knows is based on theoretical deduction and not on observation or experience, right? Does he have any practical knowledge of anything? No, yeah, everything is, right, everything's theory, right? Everything to him is theory. This means that he's able to justify just about anything, right? Because he continues to subscribe to this notion that we live in the best of all possible worlds and that everything happens for a reason. So on page eight, when he's explaining you know, the origins of his own disease, he's talking about his own syphilis, right? Pangloss made answer in these terms. Oh, my dear Candide, you remember Paquette, that pretty wench who waited on our noble baroness. In her arms I tasted the delights of paradise, which produced in me those hell torments with which you see me devoured. She was infected of with them, she is perhaps dead of them. This present Paquette received of a learned grey friar, who had traced it to its source. He had had it of an old countess, who had received it from a cavalry captain, who owed it to a marchioness, who took it from a page, who had received it from a Jesuit, who, when a novice, had it in direct line from one of the companions of Christopher Columbus. For my part, I shall give it to nobody. I am dying. So he can actually provide a complete chain, right, going back to the new world, of his syphilis, right? Everybody, you know, who had it. Oh, Pangloss, cried Candide, what a strange genealogy. Is not the devil the original stock of it? Not at all, replied this great man. It was a thing unavoidable, a necessary ingredient in the best of worlds. For if Columbus had not in an island of America caught this disease, which contaminates the source of life, frequently even hinders generation, and is evidently, which is evidently opposed to the great end of nature, we should have neither chocolate nor cochineal. Right? So cochineal is a blue dye, right? But even leaving that aside, right? What is Pangloss, like, why is Pangloss saying it's a good thing syphilis exists? Because without it, there won't be chocolate. Yeah. <laughs> if, right, if, if, if Columbus' sailors hadn't brought syphilis back from North America, they also wouldn't have brought back chocolate, right? So here, you know, we've got this terrible sexually transmitted disease that, you know, eats away at the brain and at the genitals, right, and basically pre prevents people from reproducing, right, or frequently does. But that's okay because it means now we have chocolate. And it doesn't even matter to him that he's dying of this disease, right? It doesn't seem to bother him. And by the way, like one thing is, you know, when Pangloss is eventually hanged, right, he'll be back. One thing you will probably notice as we go through this is the characters don't stay dead for long. Everybody keeps, like, everybody you think is dead, just about, 
keeps coming back, right? With the exception of poor James the Anabaptist, who thus far has been the only genuinely decent person in the narrative and gets no reward for that, right? And I think that that's kind of part of the basic argument here, right? If this was the best of all possible worlds, wouldn't the character who is morally good be rewarded? Wouldn't somebody who does what he can to help others and to be kind actually get ahead in life? But instead, the guy who believes the best of all possible worlds philosophy, right, says that it's necessary that he be drowned because that's clearly why this bay was created. And this is a big part of Voltaire's argument, like stemming from this Lisbon disaster, this earthquake. Like he's said, like nothing good comes out of this, right? There was no reason for it, or at least no you know moral or spiritual reason for it. You know, it's, there, are, there are geological reasons it happened, but you know it's. <clears throat> It's, you know, it's not right or fair that so many people died for no good reason. And you can't claim that the world is good and just and fair if things like this regularly happen. Now, he does work that Lisbon earthquake into the narrative here as well, right? It's you know, just after the earthquake that Candide and Pangloss arrive in Lisbon. But what do the like what do the people of Lisbon seem to think caused the earthquake? Were you able to, to gather this? Why do they think the earthquake happened? I think we kind of get a hint on page 13. Or maybe a better question would be, what do they think is going to stop another earthquake? Oh, oh, <laughs> yeah, basically, gathering up some heretics and burning them alive, right? So. An auto de fe um, is um, a kind of carnival like event in which people whom the Inquisition of the Catholic Church regarded as heretics um, were rounded up, paraded through the streets, and then kind of tortured and executed in um, very very theatrical ways, typically, right? And the assumption that the learned professors of Lisbon come to, or the learned professors of Portugal come to, is that holding one of these, right, will <clears throat> prevent future earthquakes because clearly this one happened because the people were too sinful, were too tolerant of heresy, right? There are too many people who aren't true believers hanging around here, so what we've got to do is round them all up and do something with them. And then this won't happen again. So then on page 13, in consequence hereof, they had seized upon a Biscayner convicted of having married his godmother and on two Portuguese for rejecting the bacon which larded a chicken they were eating. Now what does that tell us about if, if, the, if these two guys would uh, rejected the bacon that was uh, part of the chicken they were seasoning the chicken they were eating. What does that mean? What are they? They weren't Catholic. Not Catholic, but more specifically, what would that suggest about them? Uh, 
Eh, Protestants can eat bacon, right? I mean, break it away from you. Yeah, so anybody who um, expresses Protestant attitudes, yes, would probably be rounded up here, right? If they won't eat bacon, it means they're probably they're, it means they're probably Jewish. After dinner, they came and secured Dr. Pangloss and his disciple Candide, the one for speaking his mind, the other for having listened with an air of approbation. They were conducted to separate apartments, extremely cold, as they were never incommoded by the sun. Eight days after, they were dressed in San Benitos and their heads ornamented with paper miters. The miter and San Benito belonging to Candide were painted with reversed flames and with devils that had neither tails nor claws. The Pangloss's devils had claws and tails, and the flames were upright. They marched in procession, thus habited, and heard a very pathetic sermon, followed by fine church music. Candide was whipped in cadence while they were singing. The Biscayner and the two men who had refused to eat bacon were burnt, and Pangloss was hanged though that was not the custom. The same day the earth sustained a most violent concussion. So what happens at the end of all of this ritual and all of this suffering that's designed to present another earthquake, prevent another earthquake? Okay. Another earthquake, right? Yeah. So <clears throat> this is part of that anti-superstition trend that we find in Enlightenment thinking. This idea that people tend to um, attribute false causes to events, right? And thus act based on faulty information. Because all you know, this, this auto de fe that they host has no practical effect, right? It does not do the thing that they think it's going to do. All they end up doing is, you know, killing a few people who weren't harming anyone in the midst of, you know, an already kind of massive amount of suffering, right? So what are we getting so far? I mean, I, I think it's also interesting here, too, that Voltaire clearly thinks Pangloss is full of shit, right? But does he also seem to think that Pangloss should be allowed to speak his bullshit? Because how does he present the people who actually try to shut Pangloss up? Pangloss is an idiot, right? But who's worse? So Pangloss is clearly depicted as an idiot. But who's worse than Pangloss? Well, <laughs> maybe not God, right? Yeah, but James I think the Anabaptist. What's well? No, James the Anabaptist is the good is the, the only good guy, right? Ten. What's that? Ten. I don't know. I can't pronounce his name. I, th I, th I, th I, th I think like what I'm getting at here, right, is that um, even though Pangloss is a moron. And his philosophy is, at best, you know, passive and at worst, actively harmful. The novel is even meaner or kind of more scathing towards people who would try to censor him, right? You know, the people who dress him up in a silly costume and then hang him because they don't like his philosophy, right? So the you know the, the, the inquisition of the church comes off actually worse here. So it's still following that enlightenment principle of freedom of expression, right? That even if some even if you know someone is talking something you know is bullshit, right? It's okay to call them on their bullshit, but it's not okay to censor them and hang them, right? So we're about out of time for today since we started, but uh, about 10 minutes early. So let me give you the reading questions for next time. Make sure to turn in free rights as you go. 
Oh, so Thursday I should give you both of them. What's that? Thursday I give you both of them. Uh, yeah, I, I, I guess just do one at home. And yeah, and then do one in class on Thursday. And what we're doing here, by the way, the reason we're looking at this and then looking at Rousseau um, starting next week um, is to lay the groundwork for the French Revolution reacting game. Right? I want you to understand the ideas that are being debated in the revolution before you have to you know, try to be mouthpieces for any of them. 